First Kings, please. First Kings chapter 17. It is really easy to find in my Bible because I have a pagan dog and apparently likes to eat the Word of God. I mean, not really, ch it's chewed, it's not gone though, so maybe she, she just wants to consume it to make it part of her, I don't know, maybe she's very spiritual. First Kings chapter 17, are we there? First Kings 17, let's start in verse 1. We're going to read a few verses. We're going to read up to verse, I believe, uh, verse 16. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was one of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, that I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass, while that brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Here's today's big idea. You can be in the center of God's will and everything be terrible around you. And when this happens, obey God for the sake of honoring Him, not because of any earthly outcome. Let me say this again. You can be in the center of God's will and things be terrible all around you. When this happens, obey God for the sake of honoring Him, not because of any earthly outcome. I'm going to say this, we owe God obedience. I think very sadly, when, when things go bad, we try to encourage people but sometimes we lie. Sometimes we try to, to be spiritual. I know at, at, uh, as a teenager, there's other Christians, and when somebody uh, would break up, uh, you know, the boyfriend or girlfriend, we would say, hey, don't worry. When God closes one door, he opens another. Doesn't that sound so spiritual? No, it doesn't mean that. That's not purpose of it. We get the idea that we, we're going to live our best life now. Let me tell you something. If this earth is your best life, that means you're going to hell. Your best life now? No, thank you. This is my worst life that I will ever, ever live. And things are pretty good, to be honest with you. This is not my best life. Heaven, that's going to be my best life. We literally, as Christians, talk as if nothing bad is ever going to happen. Oh, I'm, I'm really going through this. Well, you need to trust in God. Well, that doesn't mean the situation's going to go away, amen? Um, you look at people in the Bible. They're not all holding hands, skipping, singing the sound of music. Amen? You look at even the book of Hebrews that talks about how believers have suffered the worst things, of whom, by the way, the world was not even worthy. of. The reality of what I'm saying 
is that we simply owe God obedience. He owes us nothing other than what He's promised in His Word. But I would say our big problem is that I think many times we would prefer earthly blessings rather than heavenly blessings. We talk as Christians about how wonderful heaven is, but yet our actual time, it acts as if this earth is our last stop. And we try to pile up things on this earth. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. One of the hardest things uh, that Christians have of really giving to missions and do you remember when we talked about the need for missions? One of the biggest obstacles is that this world has got us into so much debt. What are we on, the iPhone 93 or what? I, I remember uh, uh, a friend of mine did an upgrade from the iPhone-like 6 to iPhone 7. And nothing was different about it. But iPhone will tell you, man, if you don't get this, you're going to miss out on life. Or it's not just iPhone, it's Google, it's Android. It's This whole world is honestly about you being dissatisfied. is not to be content in the state God has you in. And this, is, this has really been, uh, this is uh, amazing for me, because God is speaking to me about a few things. I hope God will speak to you about a few things. But I, I think it's important as we go through uh, these next few chapters, I first want to highlight the big characters. Can I do that? This is a little different than how I normally preach, but I kind of want to highlight the big characters. The very first big character that we're going to come to is Ahab. Now, who is King Ahab? At this point, King Ahab is king over Israel. Now, what do I mean by Israel? I don't mean all 12 tribes. I mean that there was a divided kingdom. There was a civil war, if you will. And uh, two tribes broke off, Judah and Benjamin. And then the rest were Israel. When we see Israel mentioned now, from now forever, you'll see Israel and Judah, Israel and Judah. No, Israel is always, always wicked. Just terrible. Sometimes there'll be bright sparks with Judah, but Israel itself is terrible. They have given themselves over to idolatry. I'll tell you something. God got, has gotten Israel out of idolatry. You go to Israel today, you'll see Westerners put up statues to King David you'll see those statues as horribly disfigured now. Because the Jews say, no no images, please. They do not put up with it. Evil rulers, by the way, are a judgment against the wicked people. God will give humanity the kind of rulers they deserve. We will never have good rulers until we, as a nation, repent of our wickedness. Individuals may, but our country, our country is wicked. Our country is so foolish. Is it no wonder that our government follows suit? The government is simply a a reflection of the people that they are ruling. Now Ahab comes on the scene. If you will, go ahead and look at 1 Kings 16, Ahab comes on the scene in verse 29. 1 Kings 
16, verse 29. And in the 30th and 8th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. Now remember, we've already talked about that these are two nations now. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. He was a wicked, wicked man, and he outshone all kings before him in wickedness. And his problem was that he had a very flippant view of sin, and we will see that. We will see um, at, at how when sin is there, uh, he, he just didn't care. Let, let me say a few things that God said out of Jeremiah. If you will, look at Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. God is speaking here. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. God says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, will they be cast down, saith the Lord. I want you to kind of maybe, if, if you take notes or if you have a pen, underline that. Neither could they blush. When a people lose the ability to be embarrassed, that shows something wicked about them. I just want you to know, and uh, I am so grateful to be around your kids. And there's two things I won't, will not allow. I'm not saying it won't happen, but if I see it, it'll be corrected and sorted. I don't put up with bullying. Now, bullying has gone a long way. I think, I think it's okay to tease somebody. Somebody does something silly and we tease them about it. That's just part of growing up. But I think once we get to cruel and bullying, even physically bullying, that has no place in the body of Christ. Amen? Not only that, and I see this creeping in from time to time, anywhere I go, Perversion begins to creep in. And double meanings of words and phrases get used among our kids that actually lead them to think of wicked things. I want you to know, if I see that, I'll stop that right away. Because our kids need not to think that immorality, perversion is a joke. Amen? They need to blush about these things. They need to blush when, when things are wrong. They need to say that is wrong. That needs to be their heart. Israel failed because they never blushed. If you watch anything at home, and I know as good Christians, none of us have TVs. I know this. But if you ever go to a neighbor's house and watch something there, and something is inappropriate, or even just two people just go, what are the younger kids going to do right away? What are they going to do? Get going. Oh, they're kissing, right? That's what they do. Anything else goes on, I mean, they are really covering their eyes. Because they blush. That's innocence. Do we as adults just go, Give me more. I love nature. The Bible talks about that there's a point where the eagles will pluck at the wicked's eyes. 
Why do birds pluck at eyes? Because that is the very last thing that your body will do to protect itself. It'll, it'll blink, it'll, it'll try to move. If there's any life in a person, their eyes will be blinking, correct? You watch somebody's eyes when wickedness comes up. If there's no blinking, I wonder how much life is there. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 12, just a couple of pages to the right. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they will be cast down, saith the Lord. Walking in sin, in any sin, is never a light thing. Sadly, Ahab viewed it that way. Ahab also was unequally yoked. His wife was uh, not a uh, Jewish woman at all. Uh, she was not even a believer. She was from uh, Phoenicia, and we'll cover that later. But the Bible is very clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together as, as with unbelievers. And this is marriage. This is business. And this is fellowship. Now, I've got unsaved friends. I hope you do too. Because you need somebody to witness to, amen? But I promise you, I don't fellowship with them. I fellowship with my believers. You know why? Because we have everything in common. That's vital. Ahab eventually built a temple to Baal, or sometimes he's called Baal. Probably the correct way to pronounce it is Baal. I will pronounce it both ways. He served false gods. Have you ever seen pictures of India? or videos of people worshiping in India. You could Google this later. I've seen videos where people will follow a cow until it urinates, and they'll cup their hands and rub it in their face. This is accurate. And anything else the cow does, they'll mat it in their hair. Pastor, why are you saying that? I'm saying false gods require so much out of people. What does God require out of you? Seriously. Besides you. Yeah. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He doesn't require you to take your babies and throw them into a fire. He doesn't require you to crawl on your hands and knees. He doesn't require you to hurt yourself. Yet there are so many false religions out there that do that, and people wholly give themselves to it. And people never abandon their false gods. But we abandon God when He does not answer in the manner and time frame in which we feel we are accustomed. Where is God? The Bible says, My God's in the heavens, and He doeth whatsoever He will. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2. Excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 10. Look at the folly of false gods. By the way, I, I need to pause here for a second. It's, it's towards Christmas, and so you're going to start seeing all these little memes and videos of why Christmas is the most satanic thing ever.
garbage. As a matter of fact, I haven't seen a single video that has been accurate. And here's one. They'll give this first and say, this is against Christmas trees. Okay? Now, number one, you know why we know it's not against Christmas trees? They didn't have Christmas trees back then. Ugh. But read it. Let's, let's go over together. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Oh, it's Y2K. Oh, the Mayan calendar only goes up to 2012. What are we going to do? Right? Don't be like the heathen. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. Now look, it's not just they chop down the tree, now they're shaping it. They're building an idol. They deck it with silver. Deck the halls. No, this is not what it's saying. They deck it. They, they then put uh, on this wooden god, they put silver and gold to make it more of a god. And they fasten it with nails and with hammers that it moves not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. God says, look, all these people have fashioned gods after their own images, after their own likings. And God says they're foolish because they can't do anything. If you want your God to go from here to there, you're going to have to carry it. It can't do anything. Don't be afraid of it. So many people get spooked over the weirdest things. They're afraid that if, if they enter a certain place, you know, uh, all these little mini pixies or whatever is just going to uh, drag. God says, stop worrying about those things. Amen? So we have Ahab. We also have Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, the daughter of the king of Phoenicia. And we've already covered this in, when we looked at the book of the Revelation. But in Revelation 2.20, it, it describes her as a, as a uh, harlot. It describes her as using charm and seduction to enslave God's people with idolatry. And that's exactly what she did in Israel. But then we have Elijah. Who's Elijah? Elijah's the man of God. Elijah is the prophet who gave no prophecies. I want to stress that to you. In the Bible, we see prophets. Very little of them ever told of a future event. So when somebody says, I have the gift of a prophet, you know, they don't even do it like the Bible does. But this is a prophet that gave no prophecies. He's a prophet in the most uh, a biblical way. He proclaims, thus saith the Lord. Look, if you will, in Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Do you see that? What does that mean? Does that mean Mormons are right? Humans become gods? No. He's explaining something. Remember what Moses didn't want to do? Anybody remember? He didn't want to talk in front of Pharaoh. More than likely, if, we're, if I'm understanding it right, he had a stuttering problem. To God, I'm slow with speech. And you know, who, who made your mouth? Who made your tongue? If I tell you to do it, go do it. And God says, nonetheless, okay, I'll now, instead of you be my prophet, you are going to tell Aaron what to say. And Aaron is going to be like a prophet. In other words, he's now going to listen to you. That's all a prophet does. A prophet listens and echoes what God says. That's what a prophet does. And by the way, 
if a prophet uh, uh, attempts to do anything outside of that, they're a false prophet. Look in Deuteronomy 18, please. What was oh, Okay. <laughs> Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, starting with verse 18. I will raise uh, uh, them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto me, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all I shall command him, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. By the way, do you see what God says about a prophet? God says, when I set up my man, I'm going to put my mouth in his, my words in his mouth. You better listen to him. Isn't that what it says? So, I mean, literally, we better be careful, right? So the God says, I'm pretty sure people can abuse it. So verse 20, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall be given a second chance. Is that what it says? What does it say, Rebecca? Die. Is that pretty serious? Yeah. You know why? God, remember, God says, you better listen to this guy. And when somebody says, oh, I think God has commanded you to make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. They can abuse that. Do we know of people in pulpits that abuse their position? Yes or no? Yeah. And God does not take that lightly, especially a prophet. He says, the person that speaks falsely, presumptuously in my name, he should die. God confirms prophetic words. It will never contradict Scripture, amen? And it is always 100% accurate. Now, there's a prophet named Bob Jones, not from Bob Jones University, okay? And this comes from uh, the prophetic ministry, Rick Joyner, Morningstar Prophetic Newsletter, all right? He says, there's a prophet named Bob Jones who was told that the general level of prophetic revelation in the church was about 65% accurate at the time. Some are only about 10% accurate, and a few of the more mature prophets are approaching 85 to 95% accuracy. Prophecy is increasing in purity. But there is still a long way to go for those who walk in this ministry. Wow, 95%. Burn them. Well, he's almost always right. No. By the way, Christians. We abide by the rules of our country. Amen. For those that are looking to put little snippets, he just said to burn somebody. Not what I'm saying. We obeyed the laws of this land. And there's false prophets everywhere. But God says, if this was in Israel, they'd be gone. How many, how many of these false churches have people giving up Standing up, giving prophecies. And because they're right, a good majority, 65%, wow. God's standard is 100%. If God says, you better listen to the prophet, but they're wrong, even 5% of the time, when do you know to listen and not to listen? And the most foolish things I've ever heard somebody say when I've talked about this, they go, well, they're human, they can't be perfect. Exactly. And that is evidence that they're not speaking on behalf of God. You watch these clowns on the God channel? Man, some of these clowns were rebuking COVID in the name of Jesus. And they gave all sorts of prophecies that it was going to be done like a, like a whirlwind at the end of 2020. You know what, these clowns, very popular clowns too, nobody called them up on it. 
and their ministries are still going strong, I adjure you, never give a single penny to these charlatans. I don't care what kind of good work they say that they're doing. If they are so foolish that they are going to presume to speak on behalf of God, that God is giving them a prophetic word and it is not 100% right, remove them. And don't be afraid of them. So he was a prophet. He was a servant who obeyed God even when it wasn't easy or nice. How easy do you think it was for God, uh, for, um, for Elijah to say, it's no longer going to rain? Who does that affect? Everyone. Yeah, Ahab is terrible. Jezebel's worse. But it affects everyone. But God said, do it. We're going to read about that there's a woman who's starving to death. She has just enough food for one more meal. And Elijah says, yeah, go ahead and make me something first. Does that sound nice? No, but he did what God said. And by the way, every time it was amazing. Sadly, more people get offended with a man of God because he contradicts their friends when they should be upset that their friends are contradicting the Holy Spirit. Even worse, people get upset with God when He doesn't serve at their beck and call like a genie with unlimited wishes. Folks, basically what I'm saying is I think we've lost the awe of the holiness of God. So in verse 4 of going back to 1 Kings chapter 17, God tells uh, Elijah, go east, the brook of Cherith, stay there. I'll take care of you. Now why go by a brook? Anybody know? Well, in a time where there's no water, you need to be by a water source, right? And this was near Jordan. Jordan means down from Dan. Dan, the most northern nose, uh, uh, city, area, tribe, the water flows down from there. And look in verse 4. It says, And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook that I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now let's talk about ravens for a second. Ravens. Anybody serve, serve raven for Christmas? Yes or no? No. Why not? Huh? They're scavengers. We don't eat scavengers. Except like shrimp and lobster. <laughs> but birds will just, it won't be good. They're scavengers. What do you think is all over their little talons? Do you think they, they go by the... Let's wash our hands really good with antibacterial soap. I, I think the reason why God uses ravens here is because they're unclean. They're just common. Church, let me pause here for a second. God excels at using the common. He excels at it. Matter of fact, I'll even say this. In my experience, God rarely uses the talented. Oh, they've got so much this, so much this. Yeah. Look, if you will, at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. 
By the way, while you're turning there, help me out. What is 1 Corinthians? Corinth. That's part of Greece, yes or no? Yeah. What is, at this time, what is the most important thing to the Grecian mind? Philosophy, wisdom. Actually, philosophy uh, is literally the love, philosophy, wisdom, love of wisdom. Now, look what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 1, 21. For after that, in wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. See that? God's wisdom, man's wisdom doesn't even pick up. Verse 22, for the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness. Why a stumbling block to the Jews? Well, they've already rejected him as Messiah. So it's a stumbling block. How dare you still preach that that he's Messiah, we've already chosen to kill him. That's their thinking. And the foolishness to the Greeks is foolishness. God die for mankind? That's dumb. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God as if he had any, is wiser than men. And the weakness of God, as if he had any, is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things in the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to, uh, uh, to, bring to naught things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in His presence. See who God is? God's not hamstrung. God can use some of the most worthless vessels and redeem them and use them for His glory. Amen? He used unclean, dirty birds. <laughs> By the way, when these birds brought Him, uh, you know, God sent them to get, a, uh, get food. What do you think they wanted to do with that food? Eat it. Yeah. They had to work outside their own wants and desires, didn't they? See why God used them? I think He's trying to teach us something. Could you imagine? If they just did what they were created to do, they would be more of a hindrance than a blessing. But let me ask you a question. Where do you think they got the food? Every morning, meat and bread. Every night meat and bread. We're in the middle of a drought. Where do you think he gets this stuff from? Seriously. Do you think there was a little special bakery in heaven? You know, where they, they roasted some, some, some good lamb and, and uh, made, made a good tiger loaf bread, right? That's going to be in heaven, amen? Tiger. Anybody not know what tiger loaf is? You know what tiger loaf is, don't you? Another great thing Jamaicans brought over. That is a Jamaican thing. Oh, it's great. You know where I think, you know where I just think is appropriate? I think every day Ahab would sit down at his dining room table. He smells that fresh bread. And he's, he's got some lure pack on the side. He's ready, right? And he smells that, that roast meat. Oh, this is great. And he's like, all right, let's feast in. And then just all these dirty birds, all these ravens swoop down. Rah, 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 take everything. 
And they just bring it over to the prophet Elijah. And he has a feast. And then at night, he, uh, uh, I'm sure Ahab is like, All right, bring it out now. And no signs of birds anywhere. And I'm pretty sure he even gets uh, mint sauce for his, uh, for his lamb. And he's all ready. And, ah, and ah, ah, all the ravens come again. Couldn't you just see God do that? Every day, no matter what was happening, morning, night, morning, night. These dirty birds <laughs> were feeding the prophet. Now, he was also by a brook. Go back to uh, 1 Kings 17, please. 1 Kings 17. And verse 7. God sent him by a brook, and in verse 7, and it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Now, Christian, listen up. Elijah was a prophet of God. Amen. God sent Elijah to this brook. Amen. The brook still dried up. Just because you're following the word of God, it doesn't mean that the brooks in your life are not going to dry up. Sometimes you'll be in the center of God's will doing everything right, and the very thing that God has given you to depend on is now gone. What do you do? Well, it's time to trust Him some more. And if that's the end of your life, that's the end of your life. Anybody think they're going to be here in the year... 2,200? Anyone? Maybe in the Millennial Kingdom. Maybe. That's it. There's going to be funerals for us, all of us, in the next hundred years. All of us. Every single one in here. Somebody is going to put you in a casket and put you in the ground. Everyone. Unless you choose to be cremated. Why do I say that? Because we, we, we struggle so much. i got to have this. i got to have this. And God says, no, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Yeah, but I want all those things shall be added unto you. God says, that's not important. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Elijah was by the brook and he was smack dab in the middle of God's will. But the brook still dried up. Christian, Things will not always go your way. And that's okay. Christian, the very thing that you thought was the very answer in life will dry up and go. And ladies and gentlemen, that is okay. So, what is God going to go? Oh, my, my car got destroyed. Is God going to give me a new car? Uh, well, I always wanted a Lamborghini. No, he might let you walk for a couple years. Oh, no, 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 no. Not the God I serve. Well, maybe not. But the God of the Bible, 